As you know, we're going through those concepts which are traditionally associated with Advent. Last week, we thought about hope, and this week we move on to peace. Joy and love are sure to follow. But there was something I forgot to mention last week, though you would have picked up on it during the message, hopefully. It is this, when I talk about hope, peace, joy and love in the Christian context, I am not alluding to them in the way the world might understand these ideas. In Christianity, these things have no connection to what the world means by hope, peace, joy and love. Christian hope, as we saw last week, is a longing for an outcome guaranteed by Christ himself. It most certainly isn't wishful thinking, fantasy or optimism. In the same way, Christian peace, joy and love are far superior to however others may conceptualise those things. The difference is, in our faith, they are all transcendent. They have nothing to do with life circumstances and everything to do with relationship with God in which we experience them. Nor are they dependent on other people's responses to us. They are a function of being in Christ. To take peace as the current example, Jesus says this in John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So what do we see there? Peace is a divinely imparted gift. Christ doesn't give as the world gives. And it's not something the world could give anyway. It is a quality of peace unknown outside of relationship with God. But like all gifts, it can be rejected. And Jesus counsels his followers not to allow themselves to become troubled or afraid. Like those unwanted Christmas gifts, fluorescent green socks or Slade's greatest hits, we could metaphorically throw Christ's peace into the old wardrobe in the garage, if we really were that dumb. And my apologies to anyone who may have bought me stylistically challenged footwear or music for Christmas this year, but the old wardrobe beckons. I will try to look pleasantly surprised though. Anyhow, going to take you to Mark 40, sorry, Mark 4, 35 to 41 says this, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Hmm. A lot of people think there is a miracle in this account, but actually there are two. Yes, there's the miracle of Jesus calming the storm, but there's one before that. Because it doesn't matter how much inner peace you've got, I defy anyone to sleep through a fierce squall in the stern of an open boat, which is rapidly filling with water to the point where even seasoned fishermen think they're going to drown. Naturally, that just can't be done. Anyhow, the disciples are playing the headless chicken gambit. They're in a flap. Their boating skills are no ma match for a squall like this. And they wake up the man. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now, I've been tempted to reply, well, since you mention it, I'm not hugely bothered, no. But I can be a bit grumpy when I've been woken up. 
Jesus doesn't do that, of course. He stands up and he solves the least of their problems. He calms the storm. Mark tells us he speaks to it. Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. But then Jesus wants to address a far more serious issue. He asks them, why were you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Good question, really, isn't it? And it goes to the heart of the matter. The real problem isn't that their boat will shortly become a U-boat. It's their faithless perception of those circumstances, specifically that they have no peace because they have no faith. God's gift of peace in any and all circumstances is closely related to faith. Now, it makes sense, doesn't it? How could I experience God's peace when I have no faith in the one who gives it? Put simply, those who trust in themselves or trust in their circumstances are in no place to access divine peace when the storms of life rage. But what would have faith and peace look like in those disciples during that storm? It might have looked like one of them just rebuking the wind and waves in Jesus' name and saying, quiet, be still. Not too likely. When invited to miraculously feed the 5,000, when Jesus said, you give them something to eat, they didn't want to know about using his power. More likely, peace would have looked like those guys sitting there completely untroubled. Sure, the boat's filling up. But we're with Jesus. We have complete security in the midst of the storm. He'll either get up and change our circumstances or our eternity with him starts the day. It's win-win. And yes, we can and should at least try to bail out some of the water. We should do what we can if only in case his plan is to save us in 10 minutes and we'll only float for another five. But what we are not going to do is be afraid. Christ has our lives and our eternities in his hand and we'll trust him whatever the outcome. We're going to keep the peace he gives us. Puts me in mind of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in Daniel 3, when the king was going to throw them into the fiery furnace, surely a fate worse than drowning. And they said this, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. That is the kind of God-given transcendent peace we're talking about. Not faith in the certainty of a given outcome, but faith and security in God, which transcends our circumstances, our situations. That is the peace which passes all understanding. And that's exactly the peace God wants all his friends to have. As Jesus once said in John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He said, I have overcome the world. And isn't that exactly what his peace offers us to overcome the world, to rise above the circumstances and troubles, the hardships and trials of this world, and to be triumphant as followers of Christ, no matter what life throws us. Real peace is a function of relationship with God. And it transcends the tribulations of life. It's actually a hallmark of being in Christ. In Romans 8, 6, Paul puts it like this. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. When our minds are governed by the Holy Spirit, 
we have peace and freedom. We are no longer subject to the vagaries of this world in the same way others might be, though they may still happen to us because they are almost incidental. Our lives are hidden in Christ. And peace gives us the ability to look at a situation, however dire, and say, what response is God looking for in these circumstances? We are not overwhelmed by it. We are only overwhelmed by his provision of peace. Many years ago, when I was at regular AA meetings, they used to have helpful little signs scattered around the room. One of them simply said, and I shall put it more delicately than the sign did, don't drink even if your bum falls off. Now, I never saw anyone's bum fall off, and my, my own remained firmly attached. But what I did see was a constant stream of members trying to cope with crisis after crisis, bereavement, eviction, divorce, bankruptcy, redundancy an illness. I was an avowed atheist back then, but even I couldn't fail to notice that the ones who didn't relapse, the ones who could cope with their problems, were the ones who had faith in Jesus. They'd sit there and share what was going on. And they'd always seem to have this weird attitude when life had delivered them a container load of lemons. It wasn't that it didn't hurt. It was just that they were at peace about it. They had that much vaunted serenity that AA always banged on about. With hindsight, I can see that it was a natural function of their relationship with God. They were using the program as originally intended, as a resource for drawing close to him. And it was having the desired effect. Others who couldn't access that peace that passes understanding, they disappeared from the meetings. We'd often hear what had happened though. There was a euphemism for it, as in, did you hear about Peter? His bum fell off. A lot of alcoholics have no defense against the first drink because they don't have the peace of God. Let me put it like this. There is nothing that could happen to you that you couldn't cope with if you have that peace. It might be inconvenient, painful, even terminal, but the peace of God will completely minimize the effect it has on your mind. And the mind is home territory for fear, anxiety, protection, projection and panic. It doesn't just host all that stuff. It's where it breeds, it's where it grows strong. And I'm not talking about those with recognized mental health conditions here. I'm talking about ordinary people with ordinary lives which have gone or threatened to go pear-shaped. Perhaps you noticed a little line in that account of the storm. It says this, there were other boats with him. Can you imagine what was going on in their minds as their boats took on water in that violent squall? At least the disciples could appeal directly to Jesus in their panic. Those other guys had no hope at all. Their lives were about to go pear-shaped too. So let's rewind. Let's think about what could have happened, but didn't. There's the violent storm, driving rain, and water flooding into the boats. People fighting with the oars, people fighting to hold onto their stomach contents and and in the midst of this tiny armada, Jesus, soaked and buffeted around, is lying unbelievably crashed out on a cushion. And his motley crew, they're just sitting there, bailing a bit, rowing a bit, and chatting amongst themselves, while all around are in frantic disarray. Do you know what a powerful witness that would have been? A bit like the witness of the alcoholic who sat sober and peaceful in a meeting and told us quietly that his young wife had died suddenly. The peace of God, the peace that passes understanding, 
is a priceless resource for the Christian. It is access by faith, like salvation, and it is a total game changer. But it is also an amazing witness to those who don't know Jesus. Yes, it's primarily for our benefit, but when others see it carry us through a crisis, it can have a profound effect. It is strong evidence that Christianity really does make a difference. Peace is our birthright as believers. It can never be divorced from faith. The disciples lack faith, and so they also lack peace. It is the hallmark of a God-centered life because peace is a product of submission to God and a refusal to be driven by our circumstances. It always minimizes the effect of any problem because it precludes the additional burden of worry or panic which normally accompany such things. Peace is a God-given coping mechanism and it is available to all who are in relationship with him. A lack of peace may cause unnecessary heartache, anxiety and grief. It may damage relationships. It may cause illicit, inappropriate responses. It may seriously downgrade the quality of life. But peace itself, it's a wonderful resource. Not only that, when life delivers a container load of lemons to our door, peace is an incredible witness to all those around us. Now, maybe you're going through the mill right now. Most of us do from time to time. Just take a moment to think about how you're coping. Are you playing the headless chicken gambit? Or are you focusing on your saviour? Is Jesus metaphorically going to come round after 40 weeks and accuse you of lacking faith? Or is he going to commend you for drawing close to him in a crisis? You know, when I was ill, I genuinely didn't know if I would live or die. But I discovered that wasn't actually the real issue. The real issue was my relationship with God. That's what mattered. That's what transcends my circumstances. And that is what gives me peace. The same relationship can have the same effect for you. May we pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the truly wonderful facility of peace which you freely give to those who rely upon you. Thank you that you have commanded us to experience it when you said, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Lord, help us to obey this command. Help us to utilize the kind of faith which sees us triumph over adversity by not allowing it to overcome us. And when life does get cut tough, Lord, help us witness to other people by how we conduct ourselves under pressure, focusing on you rather than on our problems. In Jesus' name, Amen.